We're going to do a rain dance. Just to bring us all in together. This is a rare glimpse inside the road to recovery from ice addiction. I was just to be really aggressive. Instead of taking my aggression out on people, I'd like, you know, just turn around and punch a wall. For one brief moment, I thought, how much better would everyone's life be if I just jumped off this cliff? I'd done something that I probably shouldn't have done. You probably shouldn't have done it? I definitely shouldn't have done, mm -hmm. you know. I lost my wife to addiction, waking up and finding her dead with a needle in her arm. People will come into our service mm. just ravaged. I could even make a choice of sit there and die with her or get off my ass and do this. You know, ravaged sometimes in white smocks from the psych ward. You know, picks on their faces, gaunt. Um, and I'll say, you know, what happened? How long have you been using? Six months, eight months. I mean, which is unbelievable. Jackson Oppie is the general manager at the Raymond Hayter Clinic in Geelong. Like all of the counsellors here, he is a former addict himself. Through our illness, we've done a lot of damage to a lot of people. Now, I often joke that never once did I pick up the ice pipe and say, right, what I'm going to do now is sit here for the next three days, blow my brains out with ice, then go wandering and end up in a psych ward in seven days. I never did that, but it happened. This is not a destination. This is just part of the early stages of recovery, yeah? I'm not too bad today. I slept on it last night. When I was in active addiction, I was having the voices in my head. Yeah, over the last two years, I overdosed six times. The last 24 hours has still been pretty daunting. They don't understand addiction. Just so having the, com the com confidence to go approach my brothers and my parents and actually say I'm sorry and make amends to them, I think that's a really But thing everyone here is making me feel real at home. For someone who's been here three days, wonderful. You're going to do really well. 60 kilometres away at the sister facility in rural Victoria, it's the morning check-in. Just for today, I want to live and enjoy life. To do that, I will put my recovery first. The women are sharing how they feel with other recovering addicts. Beck, you did really well on Sunday when your family visited. So the one thing you can put at ease is you know your children are safe. Becky is the newest arrival. The single mother has used ice daily for two years. It's day nine for her here. Like, I'm going to have to be really, really strong in here, you know, so that I can be strong for my kids when I get out. Um, it's going to be really hard. Life in rehab is structured. Up every morning at 7am. Their days are filled with group therapy, counselling and household chores something some of them have never done. We've got to really get the sanitizer going. A lot of guys are leaving a lot of plates or bowls, especially in the sink. Um, we really need to set a good example for the rest, or even like Jack, for some of the new guys coming into the community. Um, it's all designed so addicts can begin to imagine a life without drugs. I think there's a belief out there, and it's quite widespread, that once ice has you in its grip, you're done. No, that's not true. What we've seen is that long-term residential treatment mm. with intensive support is really effective in treating ice. Yeah. Um, Nearing the end of her ice treatment my... is Britt Hallett. I'm really happy to be here and to be giving back mm. and to support you girls, to be with you girls. We met the 31-year-old mother of three six months ago as she was about to enter rehab. In your darkest days, were you aware of what your addiction was doing to your family? Yeah. Did you care? Yeah. But I couldn't stop. No. Back then, Brit's mother Susan was at her wit's end, forced to care for her three young grandchildren as they weren't safe with Brit. I actually give up as a mother. And I never thought I would do that. 
I feel like I've hung in there for years and years and I just can't do it anymore. Are you saying you wanted her out of your life? I did. Susan felt helpless to save her daughter. After 17 years of drug addiction, broken relationships, violence and trauma, Brit was lost. Then, earlier this year, her family managed to scrape together the $30,000 for private rehab. It was Brit's last chance. And today, she's doing well. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? <laughs> oh, so good to see you. You too. You look amazing. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. I haven't been this happy ever. Did you think that this would happen, that you could feel this good again? No, not to this extent. <laughs> As part of her ongoing treatment, Brett is joining the girls at equine therapy. Some might struggle to see how horses could possibly help fight addiction, but it doesn't take long to witness the change in the girls as they connect with the animals and are forced to consider something other than themselves. I feel nervous mm. and I feel anxious and I feel, you know, a bit scared. You know, there's people, places and things that I have no control over and that's okay because I'd rather be feeling all those things than be feeling nothing at all. What's the feeling you're present to right now, Becky? Happy? Yeah. Is that happy tears? Yeah, there's some happy tears. So just breathe and let the tears come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you think this has saved your lives? Yes. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that was pretty emphatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got a long way to go, girl, but you got it. She's got it. She's got it. I've got it. The help's available if you're wealthy or if you're willing to remortgage the house. Use your super. Yeah, and I've had families sell their house, sell the second car, you know, do... It's not just wealthy families. It's, mm. um, um... It's families that, um, understand that, um, their kid could die. For those who don't have the money, mm -hmm. what happens to them? Most of them being met with a brick wall. Which is exactly what happened to Brad. He started using ice daily when he was 19 and spent the next two years homeless, living on the streets. I went from this to this, like that. So what did you have before ice? Yeah, I had a job, I had a house, I had a girlfriend, I had a good car, and then that's when I started using ice and then I lost everything within a matter of months. It cost you everything that's important to you? Yeah, everything. Brad is not alone. Australia's appetite for ice is greater than any other country. A staggering 1.3 million people have tried the highly addictive drug. But there are precious few publicly funded rehab beds. So when you asked for help, what was available to you? Nothing. Nothing. Melanie Raymond is one of the few who helps people with nowhere else to turn. She runs youth projects in Victoria. There are people who look at ice addicts and say, well, you chose to take the drug. Why should I care? Why should I help you? If we don't do this, we'll all pay a much higher price when we have to build more expensive prisons, more psych wards, employ more police, more security guards. So helping people get back, people who have made a mistake or have had a very tough life, get back onto the right path is a winner for everyone in the community. ICE is the most harmful illegal drug that Australia has ever faced. Users can erupt in a psychotic rage, giving them superhuman strength. Get off! Are you gonna lie? No. And putting the lives of everyone around them at great risk. 
How big of a decision is it for someone when they say, I'm here because I want to get off ice? It's a major life-changing decision for someone to step forward and ask for help. At the moment, if you're asking for help, you'll be on a waiting list. For and how long? You could be on a waiting list for six weeks or six months, depending on where you live. In that time where they're waiting for a bed and for help, mm -hmm. they could die, mm. they could kill someone. Yeah, all of that, all of mm. that. And their families continue to live in fear and trauma. But before coming to these sessions, yes. we had no idea. We had no idea. So coming well, to these, we? we're learning, but if there's a dip, we know yeah. how to handle yeah, yeah, yeah. it. The families need as much support as the recovering addicts. More than 60 people are in this room tonight for a family counselling okay. session. You know, going back home to live with you, but you're going to set a boundary. If you don't go to meetings and you don't comply with this program, you're not living here. For years, they've put up with the lying, stealing and abuse from their loved ones, doing whatever was needed just to keep them alive. Don't, um, don't discount your own trauma and your own needs in this recovery process. Just... They fear that if they kick them out of the house, yeah. they may never see that child again. Yeah, and, and um, families will say to me, but what if? And I explain to them, they're dying anyway. They're just dying under your roof. A familiar face in these monthly counselling sessions has been Susan Annesley, Britt's mother. I knew, I finally got it, that I couldn't do anything to help her. She had to do it herself. It's this tough love from Susan that has brought mother and daughter back together. How long have you been clean for now? 160 days. <laughs> After how many years of drug abuse? 17 years of active addiction. Mm. I thought I was doomed. That was my life. You feel she's come back to you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she has. And I love her even more for being able to do that and be so strong. Mm. She is a really strong girl. Mm. I'm very proud of her. <laughs> Keep it going here boys, 12 more seconds. For these men, this is just the beginning of their treatment. Once they complete 90 days of rehab, they remain under close supervision. We've got clinical audits um, that show that people that complete 90 days and then engage in an aftercare program, uh, but 70% of those clients are still clean one year after treatment. Today, Britt is visiting her mum and kids. She hopes it won't be too long before she gets to play a bigger role in their lives. Looking forward, I know as, as a recovering addict, mm -hmm. it's all about taking it one day at a time and yeah. to not look too far into yeah. the future. But if you take a little peek... A little peek. What do you see? I see... A cosy family home with my three children and family um, involved in my life. It's all Susan ever wanted. She has her daughter back. I do love my mum. <laughs> I do love her lots. <laughs> After 17 years of turmoil, both mother and daughter are daring to dream of a life free from addiction. It's not just about good times, it's about, you know, going through the hard times and sticking together and working through things. And we'll get there. We're already on that road. <laughs> Hello, I'm Alison Langdon. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.